need us for him. Even ladies and gents, it's Simon Brown here doing the introduction for this evening's webinar, which Keith McClachlan will be doing. Uh, before we go any further, as always, if you can hear the audio, please just raise your hand in the GoToWebinar application so that we know that we're sending audio. There we go. Dan, even uh, LP, we're getting audio going through. Brilliant. So this evening we're doing DFC. Keith did the, the first webinar about a month ago on it. It's a three-part series. This evening is part two of that three-part series. Uh, and then, of course, in about a month's time, we'll do part three. And if you're watching this in recorded video, uh, it will obviously be on justonelap.com. Part one, I, I had to re-listen. I'll make no bones about it. I think the key thing, Keith made the comment about five minutes ago. He said, you know what? He said, the point is, people aren't prepared to do the work involved in DCF models, and that's his edge. And that made perfect sense. We're lazy. We don't want to do this effort. Yes, we understand it. Yes, we agree with it, but no, we don't want to work hard. Here's the point. If it's Keith's edge, it can become ours. I and mean, if we're prepared to do the work, and, and, and how do you become a good investor? You do the effort. If we're prepared to do the work, maybe it can be our edge as well. Um, so with that, we'll hand over to Keith. You're looking at uh, part two of, of DCF. Hi, guys. Thanks, Simon. And uh, that's a fair point. Uh, without this, perhaps I wouldn't have a job. So first of all, in, in summary, and, and I'm sure you guys are sick of it, but let's do it for the benefit of the people who aren't. Uh, we're looking at the fundamentals of equities, and there's four pillars that I started off with. Profitability is the starting point of any business. Liquidity, cash is king. Solvency is quite important as debt versus risk. Management is the qualitative factor, because in essence, you're investing in people. And don't forget, these are just understanding the business. It all leads to evaluation, which we've been working through in, the, in this and the previous uh, couple of uh, webinars. And once you've got the evaluation, you actually have the investment decision. It's pretty, pretty straightforward there. Um, don't forget to go have a look at the justonelap.com webinar on four webinars, uh, on, on four pillars. It's definitely worth looking at. Um, then we're doing a lot of a lot of summary here. Uh, once once you understand the fundamentals of a business, the four pillars of fundamentals of that particular business, you can then evaluate, and there's different valuations. The first one, the first broad approach is what they call relative valuations. The next one is absolute. In absolute valuations, we've been working our way through the discounted free cash flow model, the DCF model. Uh, last uh, last month we did uh, the first part because it's a little bit of a complicated model, so I split it, uh, split it up across three webinars. This is the second of three. Um, then just recapping, and this will make a lot more sense in the next webinar. Just remember that there is such a thing as cost equity, and cost equity is the required rate of return, shareholders demand for accepting the risk of providing share capital. Cost equity then leads us to the weighted average cost of capital, the WAC. The total cost of a firm's capital taking into account both equity and debt. Now, I'm not going to spend any more time on this. Next, next uh, webinar, you will see a lot more of it. But um, I do encourage you to go back and refresh your memory, particularly for next week uh, or for, for next month, next webinar, um, about cost of equity because we will be using it. Then uh, last uh, webinar, we had a look at uh, DCS split into three parts. The first part was what is free cash flow? Discounted, discounted uh, free cash flow model, DCF. Um, so what is free cash flow? Free cash flow is operating cash flows minus capital expenditure. Let's drop it down to a formula. It's EBIT post-tax, one minus the tax rate means the after-tax rate. So it's EBIT being earnings before interest and tax. Basically, it's your operating profit. Plus depreciation and amortization. This is basically plus intangibles put through and, and non-cash flow items put through the income statement, less changes in working capital, and less capex. So the DCF model assumes a company's fair value is the present value of all its future free cash flows. It really has two parts. It has free cash flows, the future ones, and then you present value them. In part one, we looked at what is free cash flows. In this webinar, we're going to look at how you, because we don't care about past cash flows, free cash flows. We care about 
future free cash flows. Hence, we're actually, in essence, forecasting free cash flows. This webinar, we're going to look at a couple intricacies around that. Then finally, next webinar, we're going to present value them and break it down to a single absolute number, the DCF fair value of a share or of equity. So if you remember those, uh, those parts of free cash flow, we're going to work our way through each of them, and we're not going to explain them necessarily, but so much of how to forecast them. So jumping straight to uh, forecasting uh, EBIT post-tax, basically what you're forecasting here is the after-tax profits of the company. Um, now, these are after-tax profits not taking into account the financing, and, and the best way to understand how to forecast them is go back to our fundamental basic, basic webinars where we spoke about profitability. You know, profitability is really because you're forecasting profits, post-tax profits. So profitability is really the interaction of costs, of, of revenues, which are input into the business, less costs, which are an output, and that is EBIT. Now, don't forget, this is operating profit. We are ignoring interest uh, income and interest expense. Uh, and the fundamental question is, will profits be increasing, flat, decreasing in the future, or combinations thereof? Now, generally, and this webinar is actually uh, a lifetime of experience. Books could be written about it. I'm trying to summarize this. I'm going to use a lot of rule of thumbs. But generally, we would expect a decent company growing its profits, uh, well, the profits will be growing into the future, but those profits will be at a decreasing rates until they reach what we call a terminal growth rate. Basically, a company in, in a growth trajectory early on would mature, slow down growth until eventually the X growth, and that X growth is what we call terminal growth rate. And this will make a lot more sense when we hit the conclusion, which is actually graphical. So. Continuing the forecasting EBIT, uh, post-tax EBIT, you hit the final year, terminal growth rate, where it's a mature business, it's gone through the growth phase, it's comfortable, it's no longer, it can't grow. I mean, a good example is maybe General Electric or, you know, perhaps even Apple or, or the like, where it, 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 it is a company that has grown so big, eventually where can you grow to? The moon, Mars? No, you can't. You're actually just tracking broader growth. So once a business goes X growth, the real question for terminal growth rate is what is its natural growth rate will be after it's, it is the market and it is saturated everything. So terminal growth rate is best understood as a stable growth rate that goes on forever. Terrible, horrible academic assumption, but a very necessary one. So, and I cannot downplay how important picking the terminal growth rate is because when you, and you'll see this next webinar, when you, when you present value or the free cash flows of the company, often the terminal year is the majority of your net present value of this kind of free cash flows. Most of the time, it, it's between half to 75% of your absolute sum total of all free cash flows. So it's a pretty, pretty important year. You can basically change your valuation based on this year. So it goes back to understanding the company. As a rule of thumb, though, your terminal growth rate shouldn't exclude GDP growth in, be it the economy, the economies, or the globe, if it's a global company, uh, plus or minus a discount due to the particular business. And be very careful. I include this plus or minus a premium discount to the business um, because it is important, and there are better businesses, and there are worse businesses, and this is a fact. But don't be overly lavish with this and play around with the model, play around with the sensitivity and you see how, how it can change things. Um, now, there are many formulas for calculating terminal growth rates. We will go into much more detail with this on the case study. Next part of the free cash flow, because we calculated post-tax EBIT. Now, EBIT includes non-cash flow items. Now, non-cash flow items don't impact cash flows. Well, that's why they're called non-cash flow items. So, and now as a general rule of thumb, almost all businesses have depreciation and most have even amortization. These are the obvious non-cash flow items. There are more than them, but that's just for ease of reference, let's just call it depreciation amortization. 
So we have to add them back. How do you add them back? How do you even forecast future amortization and future depreciation in business? Well, what drives them? That's the starting point. Depreciation is writing off property, plant, and equipment over the economic useful life of that property, plant, and equipment, or PPE. Now, there normally is actually an average percentage. Take depreciation going back historically and calculate it as a percentage of PPE. And you tend to find it's actually, you know, within a couple of percentages this way or that way, and depending on where the company is in its growth cycle, um, you can start to start to estimate a, 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 a percentage. So if, if PPE drives depreciation, then you've got to forecast PPE to forecast uh, uh, depreciation. And the question has to be asked, is PPE increasing, staying flat, or decreasing? And the only way you will know this is by knowing the company. This is where the legwork comes in. Is the company growing? Is it, is it declining? Have they finished investing in the company? Are they still planning to go into different geographies and the like? There is no rule of thumb here. You have to start to estimate that. Now, I have a bit of an advantage where I can talk to management. I can say, hey, what are you going to spend? But... Um, Often what management say and what management does differs. So there isn't a huge advantage. Just remember, and the, the point out of this is depreciation tracks PPE changes almost perfectly. Use that. Then you have amortization. Now amortization tracks intangibles. Tangibles can be from goodwill. Now I'll touch that in a moment. Tangibles are more like R&D, uh, you know, uh, copyrights, patents, uh, and, and brand names and the like. Um, but the same as PPE, where depreciation tracks PPE, you've actually got amortization tracking intangibles. So go back, drill into a couple of years, see what percentage of amortization going through the income statement is a percentage of the, of the start and or the average uh, intangibles in the balance sheet. Um, then we have goodwill. Now, goodwill based on IFRS is no longer amortized. It has to be revalued at each period. It cannot be valued upwards, but if it's, if, if it's impairment test that shows that it is lower, you actually impair it. In essence, you know, goodwill is really hard to forecast because you're forecasting acquisitions. That's the only reason it exists. And, and you're forecasting the valuation of those acquisitions, the performance thereof. You know, the question has to be asked, should you ignore goodwill, write it off? The point is, generally goodwill, you take it as a straight line going forward and you work with the other, more, uh, the other intangibles. But think about it because you could always write it off. Then don't forget the other intangibles. I mean, there could be a multitude of time from, uh, you know, mineral rights to R&D to, to the like. These change the bottom line profits, but they don't. Do they really change the cash flows? Think about it. So we looked at post-tax EBITDA or EBIT. We look, we've then looked at non-cash flow items, which you add back to the free cash flow to get to try to approach true free cash flow in business. Now, don't forget that there's a working capital. The working capital in, in the four pillars of fundamentals, we've spoken about it as the uh, liquidity, cash is king. And networking capital, just a reminder, is creditors, less debtors, less inventory. How much have you invested into the business? And normally this is negative because working capital is a financing cost of the business. So what is, now in free cash flow, we aren't concerned about working capital, we're concerned about the change in working capital. Are you having to invest more into the day-to-day -day running of the business? And I'm not talking capex here, I'm talking creditors, debtors, creditors, less debtors, less inventory. That's, this is the formula for the change of working capital. But that said, there is a very good rule of thumb for working capital. It tends to track revenue. And I put in brackets profits because creditors, uh, are, is, it, it tends to be operating expenses. But if, you're, if your revenue is growing exponentially, the odds are you're having to invest increasing, increasing amounts into working capital. So more revenues need more inventory. Now more inventory that you sell or that you've bought needs more creditors. And when you've sold it, you have more debtors. So if you go back to the uh, formula of more creditors, less more debtors, less more inventory, your net working capital is an absolute sum has gone up. So your change in net working capital is, is more. And this is the amount you'll put into your free cash flow. So the rule of thumb is simple. Assuming debtors' days, 
creditors' days and inventory days don't change according to the historical averages, then the working capital will track profits. You could track revenues, you could track, but they'll, they'll, they'll tend to track each other. You see what I mean? The trajectory of the growth of a company will be bled down to the working capital. CapEx. Now, this is the often forgotten part of free cash flow. Fine, you're growing your business, profits are growing, uh, you're having to invest more in working capital. Don't forget you're having to use cash to buy capital goods and items, invest into the business. Investing into the business isn't necessarily inventory and the like. It's buying further properties, buying further you know, machines, buying this and that. And the question with CapEx going forward is, is the business actually spending on expansion? If it isn't spending on expansion, it's probably just maintaining uh, CapEx expenditure. So the question comes down to, and this way I touched on another one of the pillars of, of fundamentals, management. What are the intentions of the business? Are they intending to grow it? If they're intending to grow it, the odds are they're intending to reinvest into it. Hence, CapEx will be growing. But that's all nice and well. The real fundamental question for when, when, when you're trying to put, a, uh, put an absolute number into your model is how much? How much are they spending? And there, there's even a subtler question, when will this end? So now remember how I spoke in the previous, uh, previous couple of spines about depreciation tracks PPE. Well, assuming the business isn't spending and they, their profit, they, they aren't growing, they aren't expanding, their profit is flat, and they are basically, per, in a perfect world, maintaining exactly the same level. In other words, CapEx, well, theoretically, maintenance CapEx will equal depreciation because as the, the capital items are being used up, you're having to buy others. So you have to ask yourself, how quickly will CapEx be depreciated? Because that will start to influence your CapEx spend. And CapEx really has two halves. It has expansionary CapEx spend and maintenance CapEx spend. And the question has to be asked then is which phase are we and where do you see it? And once again, when I get to the conclusion, it will make a lot more sense. So just as, just as another rule of thumb, CapEx tends to peak before the growth and drop to maintenance capital once the business goes X growth or the terminal growth year. You don't spend money on expanding the business after it's grown or even during its growing. You spend CapEx we're in anticipation of growth, so you have capacity for it. Now, so we touched on each of the, each of the different uh, components of free cash flow, but now you're forecasting it, and the obvious question is, okay, how far do I forecast it? For how many years? How, how many years are important? Uh, and there's two general rules, and these are contradictory rules, but you need to understand that most evaluation is, is balancing paradoxes. So, the first general rule is the more periods you forecast, the more accurate you will be at lowering the weighting of your terminal year in your, uh, in your net present value. In other words, the more periods you forecast, the lower your terminal years, which the terminal years, to be honest, is a massive assumption, that you're lowering the risk that your terminal year is wrong and you're increasing the, the, the odds that you have the correct free cash flow or the correct DCF fair value for your, for, your, for your stock. But the opposing rule is the more periods you forecast, the greater your forecast risk. The greater, the further we look in the future, the less certainty we have. So it's the balance between these two contradicting rules that you have to walk the line to get a, to get a true DCF fair value. So I could tell you from the industry, the standard appears to be a five to 20 years. And as a huge broad range, in essence, it tends to be 10 years. I prefer using 10 years. 10 years is a, is a hell of a long time. But it isn't 20 years, and it isn't 50, and it isn't 100. Um, but five years, well, a lot can happen in five years. Uh, so I prefer using 10 years. That's my rule of thumb, unless I have something, um, something guiding me to something different. Maybe, maybe the growth plans extend beyond that, or maybe in the next point, or maybe it's a finite asset. Now, you can DCF finite assets, and a good example is, is a mine. The resource companies um, and, and the smallest one will just have one mine, and the biggest one will have a multitude of mines. But a finite asset does not 
have a terminal year. So you want to forecast the finite asset over the entire useful life of that asset. A mine, once you dig up, once you dig up all the resources, once you dig up all the minerals in a mine, there is nothing more than an expensive hole in the ground. So if you're valuing a finite asset in a DCF, make sure you appreciate it's a finite asset and ignore the terminal year. And when we ask how many years you forecast, you focus the final asset of the entire useful life, the whole period. So this is the graphical conclusion. And remember I was talking about growth rates and, and, and growth cycles of companies and different trajectories. If you can visually you know, sort of appreciate it, say this is us, the guy off the rocket in the beginning. We try to look into the future. And the company is, it's a good company. It's growing well. We, we, we've looked at the four pillars of fundamentals. We know profits are growing. Cash flows are decent. There are no sy systemic changes in anything. So we, we, can, we, we can throw that growth rate into the future and turn it down as it grows. So in, in, in the first couple of years, the EBIT, post-tax EBIT, is growing strongly. In other words, the profits are growing strongly. And hence... Your working capital will track that. Remember I said status quo, assuming nothing else changes, your working capital will track your, 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 your uh, growth in revenues and likewise your growth in profits. So as EBIT is growing strongly, your working capital will track it. You will have to be spending a lot on CapEx, expanding the company, buying properties, machinery, plant and equipment and, and the like. So you'll be spending a lot of your cash flows on actually building the future base for growth of your company. So your capex will be growing quickly too, and your depreciation will track that capex. So we reach the free cash flow for the first couple of years of growth. Then you start hitting mature growth, um, and mature growth is well, you know, the growth is slowing down, it's still there, it's still above GDP, it's still real growth, not nominal. Um, your working capital is tracking it, it tracks it again. Capex is slowing down, and your depreciation is slowing down with it, and your free cash flows will start to cool down a bit. Then you start to hit. Um, X growth and terminal growth, uh, terminal growth years, and in essence, really one, but let's talk about it as a period where your post tax EBIT goes X growth, bang. You're tracking GDP, global GDP, your GDP, plus or minus a premium or two, your call, you've you researched the company now, yet you get a good feeling for its positioning in the market, the market's performance, market's performance in the, G, in, in the global economy, the local economy, and the like. So you're so your profit cools down significantly. Your working capital will track it again, nice and comfortable. Your capex won't expand anymore. Your capex will drop down to pure maintenance. You aren't expanding. You're not buying property. You're not buying plant equipment. You're only replacing it. That's what maintenance capex is. And hence your depreciation will drop with your capex. And your free cash flow might even expand a bit in this year above the growth of your uh, post-tax EBIT. So things to consider is, is revenue growing declining? Future margin pressure or expansion? Because bear in mind, revenue is not profits, there's a difference. Returns to scale? As your revenue is growing, your profits might be expanding if you get returns to scale. Or if you've got a lot of variable costs, they might be tracking it quite closely. Increasing competition. Increasing competition is quite important because when, you know, companies can go X growth but markets and industries can also go extra, in which case competition expands perfectly and the market is shared and your margin uh, 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 crumples to uh, basically just profit and not economic profit levels. Uh, working capital, is it growing? Uh, or are they actually affect the efficiencies? Are they, are, they, are they making their working capital more efficient? This entire example, I've assumed working capital tracks your profits. They're getting more efficient or less efficient um, your working capital won't track it. For example, a company that's chasing revenue will tend to give a couple debtors days. So they'll let the guys pay a bit later. Now, paying a bit later impacts your working capital, your financing. So it impacts your free cash flows and drops your valuation. CapEx needs specific projects, expansionary expectations, maintenance, look at depreciation rates and the like, chapter management, look at forecasts. You know, look, look at their plans, where they're going, what are they doing. Uh, depreciation changes the CapEx changes. Now forget that. That is what depreciation comes from. This is the driving point of depreciation. And then never forget the other non-cash flow items. Big, small, what are they? What changes them? 
So con continuing the conclusion is we just chatted, previous webinar we chatted about free cash flows. What are they? Here we're concerned about the future free cash flows because that's what we actually, that's what we're buying when you buy equity. We're buying the future free cash flows of the business. Um, and we chatted about, you know, the infancies and it's been a very broad summary, but, uh, but, but uh, I really push you to think about it, contemplate it because there is no, you know, I've used a lot of rule of thumbs, but most of the rule of thumbs, most of the time are wrong. Uh, and, and every asset is individually valued. That's the best way to do it. So the next webinar we're going to do is we're going to put it all together because it's the DCF, the discounted free cash flow. So we're going to forecast the free cash flows, uh, and then we're going to present value all of them. We're going to strip out, and strip out the debt, add the cash, arrive at the present value for equity and arrive at a valuation answer. Any questions, guys, or have I lost you all? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> kind of kept me on board. Uh, th this is, I can see where it works as to somebody the edge. I get that absolutely and completely. A couple of points came through. The one is that, uh, and it's something which I remember from oh, 10 or 12 years ago, Cisco was growing at, I forget the rate it was, but I worked out that if it could maintain its growth rate for a decade, it was bigger than the value of planet Earth. Um, and ergo, it, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't sustainable. Uh, a couple of points also coming through um, from Chantal. She says, really like the idea of adding GDP to the to, to global GDP or relevant GDP, I suppose, to the point uh, and, and to your terminal. Level says, ultimately, this comes back to cash is king. Cash is king, liquidity. I mean, when you're buying a business, you're buying not nice to look at. You're buying cash. You, you want to make a real investment return, and that is cash rocking up in your account, be it through selling at a higher price, later in capital gain, or through dividends. Free cash flow, when it goes X growth, often turns into a more aggressive dividend cover, which is higher dividends. So cash is king. Yeah, I live, I agree. I mean, it, it, cash is king. We can count it. That's, that's what's massively important. A, a, a couple of folks were saying, and to a degree, you answered it as we came up with uh, it late in the presentation. Uh, folks, if you've got questions, put them in the, in, in the Q&A box. Um, how long to terminal growth rate? Now, you suggested 5 to 20. You said you like 10. And then I suppose the question is, it's going to depend on the business to a degree and where they are in their growth cycle, and, and they can fluctuate. I use MTN as an example. MTN, to me, was a strong growth stock. They very suddenly became a... a, a Less about growth, they increased dividends, suddenly they were pouring well, cash out. Absolutely, like I said, free cash flow when you go X growth tends to drop down to more aggressive dividends, and that's what, that's what the upping dividend policy in MTN is. But a very good example is, is Vodacom that was constrained by its Vodafone parent to just really static or South African growth when X growth very early. MTN expanded into Africa, so it had a lot of upside. So you're seeing actually a perfect case study between the two different valuations. Vodacom's growing is trading at a much higher dividend yield and, and, and a much lower price earnings than MTN. But MTN has growth prospects, and Vodacom's only just starting to hit them. Now, I need to raise the point. The concept of the terminal growth year or terminal growth rate is academic. In reality, no company ever does that. But we have to make certain assumptions when looking that far into the future. I mean, you could forecast the next million years in the free cash flow. Good luck, have fun. Um, it's not going to be very realistic. So a, a terminal, we, we try to work with the years where we have high forecast uh, certainty until we can reach an assumption where you're out of the growth cycle and using your current strategy, we can't see you doing anything more. Um, and that's the terminal growth year. There is no rule of thumb. I use 10 years, but I mean, I've used five years, I've used 20 years. Uh, uh, yes, it, it changes. It, you've got to pick it per the company. And this is where it goes back down to the fundamental principles, the four pillars of fundamentals. You've got to understand the business. Because if you don't understand the business, your odds of picking when it goes X growth will probably be way off. Yeah, and that's the point that Chantal made as well. Chantal said it's about understanding the business. And then she asks, uh, you mentioned that, that doing the legwork on, on DCF is part of your edge. Got that. 
She says, surely another part of your age is your ability to phone management. And before you answer it, um, Chantal, just because you're not uh, a senior equity analyst at a, at, a, at a major stockbroker, phone them. I've phoned CEOs in, in the days, uh, sometimes they, many times they, they brush you off, sometimes they engage you. So uh, you might not be Keith, but you can still phone. But Keith, to your, your point to that. No, and absolutely. I mean, uh, it almost sounds like an unfair advantage, but in reality it isn't. I mean, I, I'm, I work a full day and I interact with these guys, and it's my job to interact with them. So if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't, you know, in your lunch break, uh, give, drop a couple calls, even drop an email or two, and, and try to find out a couple more things. Um, if you are management of a listed entity in a public space, you, ha you cannot be closed to public inquiries. It doesn't matter who you come from. This, this should be the transparency and equality in the market, a free market, open and trading. In reality, it doesn't work like that. If you're from a big brokerage, they will listen to you more readily than if you're from you know, uh, the middle of nowhere and they've never heard of you. Uh, and they'll be a lot more receptive to the big guys. But if they aren't receptive to the little guys, it also, and go back to one of the other pillars of the fundamentals, management. If they're not willing to interact with you, doesn't that say something quite negative about how they're running the business? Yeah, and I, certainly I, I had good and bad responses. And, and then, of course, there's a company secretary who, frankly, their sole job is to engage with folks like me and you rather than the keys of it. Um, that said, the other way, and Chantal comes back with this, is how do we get the edge? Well, read Keith's research. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> nice and simple. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, not seeing any more questions coming through. Folks, I mean, I, I preface this and I think Heath would concur and, and if you've sat through the last 33 minutes, you probably concur as well. This is not the sort of stuff that we are now at a sort of half past eight on a, on a random Wednesday evening, significantly smarter. We've got to do the legwork here. There's a lot of, maybe a little denser stuff coming in, but I want to go back to what I said right up front, and it was a comment that Keith made as we were coming into the studio. This is his edge, the fact that he does it. We want to be investors. We want to create wealth. We can buy Satrix 40, and there is absolutely zero wrong with that. But if we want to really get an edge, we've got to do some PT. It's really about... If, if you make a decision, you do do investment case, and you, you work through the valuation, and you're pretty comfortable with what it is. You know, people throw around the word like, um, and, and I'm going to drop a horrible term here, but diversification is the crack cocaine of the stock market. Um, if you want to outperform, you actually shouldn't diversify. You should do the legwork. And 99% of the time, I will investigate companies and value things and come up with, hey, it's fairly valued, or it's overvalued, or there's nothing to do. But every now and then you hit a gem, and that's where you go overweight in those ones. But to be that comfortable to make that decision, you have to do the legwork. And unfortunately, that is a reality. Just like anything in life, it's what you put in is what you get out. Yeah, I, 100%. I, I, yeah, I, I, the, the, the point you made there, I think, and it, it's the diversification. I think it's a brilliant argument. It's something I want to delve down, but I, I've seen people with 40 shares, and they're not going to make, they're going to do the market. You want the guy with five or eight or maybe 10, and you get some winners. Ladies and gents, we have run time. I'm going to leave it there. My thanks for all of you for attending, uh, and as always, my thanks for keeping the classroom. Thanks, guys. Always great.